as people will hear, my story is not just about infertility. It's about coming out the other side of infertility without the prize. <laughs> I didn't get the child at the end. And unfortunately, I don't think those stories are told enough. <laughs> You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 575 with guest Rebecca Robbins. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you're here. And today we have a little bit of a different episode. It is kind of a conversation about shit that matters with unqualified people, kind of an interview with an expert. It's a former client of mine, Rebecca, and she is coming on the show to share her experience with infertility. I had a couple of you last year when you were so gracious to fill out the longer podcast survey that I send out once every year or so asking about this particular topic. And when she volunteered to come on and tell her story, I jumped at it. And it's just a really honest and vulnerable look into what it's like. Of course, this is only one person's journey, but I do think it's an important topic to talk about because I am by no means an expert on this. And I'm just glad that uh, we have her to be open about this journey that she's been on. So more about that in just a minute. The only announcement I have for you is about one-on-one -on -one coaching. The thing I wanted to tell you, this is the, the FAQ that I get the most, is how much time is involved in this. It feels like such a big commitment, I know. And I usually meet with clients either every week or every other week. I don't like to go longer than that. Our sessions are 50 minutes long, five zero. And other than that, it's up to you how much work you put in between sessions. You do have access to me in between sessions. I would say on average, my clients do about an hour or so of work. So it's really only a handful of hours a month that you need to, to dedicate to it. I'm also not doing any group coaching this year. Maybe this year, I, I really doubt it. Definitely not this quarter. And so if you do want to work with me, one-on-one -on -one is going to be the way to do it. Head on over to andreaowen.com slash links and you will see the button to find out more information about it. As the cost, the logistics, who my ideal client is, all of that, as well as the application to to get started. And of course, it doesn't obligate you to, to uh, sign up. It's just an application and then we can get on the phone together. All right, enough about that. Let's get on with the show. So without further ado, here is Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Andrea. I was so happy. And like I was thinking about calling this one of those conversations about shit that matters with unqualified people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not really that. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, you're not a, a, a professional expert in this particular field around, you know, fertility and infertility. But when I did the podcast survey early in 2023, you know, I send out a survey and ask people lots of questions. One of them is like, what do you want to hear? Is there a particular topic? I had a couple people say that they were interested in this, this topic. And so I, I will have uh, like a women's, probably a women's, um, like a hormone specialist on to talk about this. And you chimed in as a, a former client of longtime former client of mine said, Hey, I'm, I'm happy to come on and tell my story. And I accept it because this is something that I don't have experience in. I also think it's so common, so common in, in women's lives that affects, you know, the other people in their lives, their partners, et cetera, and their families. And it just is a, a story and an experience that needs to be heard. So thank you for coming on to share uh, it's your story. I'm sure it's not easy to talk about. I know, you know, you and I worked together while you were in it and I know how, how difficult it is and the grief and everything. So I just wanted to acknowledge all of that and thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I think that 
as people will hear, my story is not just about infertility. It's about coming out the other side of infertility without the prize. (laughs) I didn't get the child at the end. And unfortunately, I don't think those stories are told enough. Mm -hmm. You hear, I think that we hear a lot about people going through IVF, but then they get their miracle baby. And Mm -hmm. I am happy to share my story to help someone else out there that might be struggling or feeling alone and feeling like nobody gets what they're going through because that's how I once felt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So before we start, I, I, you know, I didn't do like a a typical bio because you're not here to talk about like what you do for a living (laughs) as an Mm -hmm. expert, but can you just, you know, briefly introduce yourself? Like where, what do you do for a living? Tell us a little bit about you on a personal level. I am a speech language pathologist by mm-hmm. day. <laughs> and a great I, and fun one at that. Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks. I own my own business, private practice called Mind Shaper SLP. And uh, we focus primarily on working with neurodivergent individuals and mm-hmm. their families. And in my practice, I really have a a foundational philosophy of involving parents in um, the work we do with their sons and their daughters. And I I say sons and daughters because I also work with young adults in my practice. That's a big part of what I do. So I don't necessarily refer to them as children. I live in Pennsylvania with my now husband. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And what might come up in my story, my road to love was a rocky one. And Andrea helped me get to a place where I was able to attract my now husband in a healthy Mm -hmm. way. And I moved to Pennsylvania to be with him in 2020. And I Aside from all of that, I'm also um, an actress. I love theater. I'm a ma- a cat mom right now as well. Yeah. <laughs> and you're also yeah. sober. You just celebrated an anniversary. Yes. So in March was five years that oh, I stopped yeah. drinking. Yeah, mm-hmm. in March. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. So let's let's jump right in. And if you could just tell us your fertility story, like what where did the journey start? So I would say that I started having baby fever when I was in my mid-20s. Mm-hmm. And it was actually triggered because um the guy that I was deeply in love with at the time, we had a long distance relationship, had a one night stand and got the woman pregnant. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So that was challenging, but it also kind of awakened the like beast within me of wanting to be a mom. And I really, you know, have been maternal my whole life. So I didn't end up actually finding a partner that I wanted to go down that road with until 2019. Mark and I started dating in February and in August of 2019, I found myself unexpectedly pre- pregnant mm-hmm. and I had just resigned from my full-time job oh, that's <laughs> to right. start mm-hmm. my private practice. Yes. So at the time, and that's important because there's like emotions that come into play with that. So at the time when I found out what, that I was pregnant, despite the fact that like, it's what I had wanted for so long. I was feeling very stressed and panicked about it because I was in a fairly new relationship, Mm -hmm. even though it was good, it was new. And I had just quit my, my full-time job, which also meant like my really good health insurance. (laughs) Oh, shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But thankfully we found out I was pregnant right before the cutoff to like get on Cobra and Mark helped me with all that. But like five or six days after I took, had the positive pregnancy test, um, I started bleeding. And it turns out that I think it was never told to me, but what I know now, I think it was probably a chemical pregnancy because when they did ultrasounds, they weren't able to find anything. So it was a very early miscarriage. I was devastated and had a lot of guilt about the fact that I wasn't overjoyed, happy, and excited about it when I found out I was pregnant. Um, and that, that guilt carried through for a while, but it also made us realize how excited we were. I was 39 at the time. I had just turned 39. We felt the pressure of time and everything. Uh So we decided to just, you know, try to get pregnant again and figured, you know, it'll just be easy. We were long distance at the time. So the timing didn't always work out for us to like, you know really be trying actively until the pandemic hit and we were living together all the time. 
And then months kept going by and every month I would get my period and it would be like, what's going on? What's going on? And then finally in June of 2020, I went to the gynecologist and had some testing done and it was discovered that my numbers were not where they needed to be. Mm -hmm. And so it was a recommendation for me to go to the fertility specialist. Right away, he told me he wanted to put me on Clomid, I believe, which I believe is, um, I never went on it, but it's supposed to stimulate the ovaries to produce eggs. And I did not feel comfortable going on a medication. Like the doc- the fact that the doctor was like, here, we're going to put you on this medication before we even run the numbers, before we even do anything. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to like dive into the research of how to boost my fertility naturally. So I read a bunch of books and followed a bunch of people and I made a bunch of changes. And then at the time I was also moving to Pennsylvania from New York. So it took me a minute to get into a fertility specialist Mm -hmm. and I had to like establish myself with a new gynecologist here in PA, all that stuff. So when I did that in PA, when I um, went to the gynecologist, I knew exactly what to ask for in terms of the testing because I had been doing some research. And I said, I want a full thyroid panel. Mm -hmm. And I knew specifically to ask for that. It was discovered that I had a hypoactive thyroid. Mm -hmm. Turns out there was actually antibodies present, present, and I have been since diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it wasn't told to me that that's what it was. But I, in my mind, I was thinking, oh, okay, this is the thing. It was my thyroid. That's why I haven't been getting it. Let's just fix it. Yeah. And then I'll get pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go on the meds and this is going to be the thing. That was like October. And it took until about February to find my right dosage of the levothyroxine. Mm -hmm. And in that process, we went to the fertility specialist. And when we're going through all the whole diagnostic process. Oh, but what was interesting when the gynecologist tested my hormone levels, they all tested in the normal levels that time, which was hopeful. Another reason why I was like, okay, it's just my thyroid. And then when I went to the fertility specialist, I had to go through a procedure called um, an HSG, which is a hystercelpingogram which is a radiological procedure that they do to test the integrity of the fallopian tubes and make Mm -hmm. sure that they're open and everything's flowing naturally. So by the time I had that procedure done, because, you know, insurance things were going on, Mm -hmm. it took a while. So it was, I think, February when I finally had that procedure done. This was my second attempt to get it done. The first attempt the doctors told me to go on an antibiotic prior to the test. And then when I went to show up for the test, I had gotten scheduled with the wrong provider. So when I got scheduled with the provider that could actually do it based on my insurance, I asked them, you know, am I supposed to go on an antibiotic prior to this? And they said, no, why, why are you asking? I was like, well, my fertility clinic had told me I had to go on an antibiotic, like, you know, preventatively going into this procedure. And they were like, no, you don't have any history of X, Y, Z. It shouldn't be necessary. So I, you know, trusted my doctors. Okay. Went through the procedure and they actually inject a dye that goes through your fallopian tubes. And that's how they see if they're open. Mm -hmm. And my left tube was blocked. Mm -hmm. So at first, when I was at the hospital, they said that, oh, we thought it was, but we were able to get it through. They ended up calling me later and telling me, no, in fact, it is blocked. And at that time on that test, the right tube looked fine. And because I ended up waking up at three in the morning that night in extreme abdominal pain, and I had a fever Mm -hmm. and I called my gynecologist and she said, go right to the ER. And I ended up with a pelvic infection and in the hospital for five days because the dye from the Mm -hmm. procedure got stuck in my tube. My fertility specialist later told me that I wish they had called me because if they had, I would have told them to put you on antibiotics right away preventatively. So it was like some negligence that happens there that I wasn't just put on antibiotics right away. 
and ended up in the hospital for five days. The recommendation ultimately was to remove my left tube that was damaged because that would impact my overall chances of getting pregnant because it throws off the equilibrium or the the balance that needs to be in the uterus. And so when I went through that procedure in June of 2021, it was discovered that my right tube was now damaged because of the pelvic infection. Oh my God. Yeah. That was really, really devastating when I, you know, woke up and this is a surgery that I had to go through and woke up and the doctor comes in to tell me the news and we were supposed, the plan at that time was for us to do IUI, which is intrauterine insemination. And that kind of took that off the table. And so we had to then do IVF at Mm -hmm. that point, which is a whole different level of financial investment. It's a whole different level of physical investment, emotional investment, all of that. We, they redid my hormone levels before going into IVF and they tested not so great again. So now I had like three hormone level tests. Two of them were not where they wanted needed to be. And one was normal. So we went forward with IVF in the fall of 2021, our first round. And, you know, granted, we don't, our insurance doesn't cover IVF. I, at this Mm -hmm. point, I have a private insurance um, because I'm self-employed. My husband's self-employed. We actually postponed our wedding. We had gotten engaged in December, 2020, but postponed our wedding so that we could do IVF. Technically, Mark split the bill for Uh us to do this. And that's another piece that comes into play for me at the end of all this emotionally, because I feel like I wasted his money. Uh So our first round, we, they almost thought they were going to have to cancel it. So when you're going through IVF, you have a period of time where they're stimulating your ovaries to produce as many follicles as possible that will hopefully turn into mature eggs that can be fertilized. And at a certain point, it didn't seem like my ovaries were producing enough follicles. And so when they in, when they cancel an IVF, it means that they kind of like stop the stimulation procedure because it doesn't look like it's going to work. Gotcha. So it looked like that was going to be the case for me at one point, but we ended, it ended up not, my ovaries started responding. They were able to retrieve seven eggs and I want to say four were fertilized, only two fertilized normally. And of those two, and then you have to wait five days to see if Mm -hmm. they develop into what's called a blastocyst. The waiting. There's a, that's such a part of the fertility journey. Like even just to like put a pin in that for a second, but even when going through a miscarriage, I don't think if you've never experienced this before, you the only re- real way they can tell for sure if you miscarried is by seeing if your your um, FSH. Yeah, uh, is it the FSH or the LH? I forget one of the hormones mm-hmm. to see if it's not. It's like when you're pregnant, that hormone like doubles, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you have to go in for repeated blood work to see if it's not progressing like it should. And so I was fortunate enough that they told me to go to the ER to figure it out because we were going into a long weekend and I was going out of state and they didn't know if I had an ectopic. So Mm -hmm. they sent me to the ER to figure it out. But if you don't have that situation, you have to wait days and days and days to get your blood work done and the blood test results, even find out if you've miscarried. It's and just, the, and the cost of the ER is if your, if your insurance is crap or you don't mm-hmm. have insurance, like it's can be like quadruple what it would be in your doctor's office. Yeah. 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 So we ended up having one embryo that made it to the blastocyst stage. And we had opted to go to do the genetic testing, which is something you can opt for. It's an extra expense that they send the embryos off to get tested to see if they're viable. Okay. That if you move forward with fertilization, that the likelihood is that the they will, or with implantation rather, that it would develop into an, a healthy pregnancy. And unfortunately, our little guy or girl did not pass the genetic testing. So we went into a second round. We were fortunate that the fertility clinic that we worked with had like this package where 
you can buy two rounds of IVF for a reduced price than if you were to just kind of do it all a la carte. Mm -hmm. So we had two rounds. And then the second round, I, my follicles seemed to respond much better, but they still retrieved only seven eggs. And this was Thanksgiving day, 2021. I had my second egg retrieval and, you know, we're still in the pandemic and Mark wasn't allowed to come in with me. Mm -hmm. I wake up from the egg retrieval and I asked them like, how many eggs did you get? And they said seven. And for some reason, I guess I just knew like there was just something about me that knew that it wasn't going to work in that moment. And I just lost it. And I just kept saying, I want, I want Mark. I want Mark. And they're like, he can't come in. I'm so sorry. So I just had to kind of sit there alone and deal with it until, um, you know, I had recovered enough from the anesthesia that I could like go out and see him again. We got the call the day after that. I think there was only two eggs that fertilized and only one that fertilized normally. And that one never made it to the blastocyst stage. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, I'm now 41. After all of that, my and because of how I responded or didn't respond to IVF, my fertility doctor did not recommend that we try IVF again with my eggs. And the recommendation at that point was for us to do donor eggs, Yeah, which, you know, we thought about and considered. But the thing about don't this particular clinic, the donor eggs, they give you this option of like, it's like a financial security option that if you basically can prove that my body is 100% capable of holding a healthy pregnancy, then there's financial security of your investment that you either walk away with a healthy baby in your arms or you get all your money back. Oh. Because you're using eggs from people that are in their, you know, fertility mm -hmm. prime. But <laughs> for me, because of the situation with my tubes, the only way I would qualify for that program would be to remove my other tube even though it wasn't completely blocked. Absolutely. After that, there would be no chance of you ever conceiving naturally by some Correct. chance. Mm -hmm. Right. We would literally be putting all our eggs in that basket. <laughs> you know, the odds of that working, I guess, are higher. Um, but for me, it was really hard for me to wrap my brain around basically sterilizing myself. Yeah. And I wasn't ever quite able to like make that choice. Plus it's not like it's free. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. another like $50,000 that we oh would have to be in our God, pockets Rebecca. for. Yeah. And when we were going through our IVF, my brother was very generous and did offer to pay for a, another round of IVF for us. Mm. And I didn't feel comfortable taking that amount of money from him because I didn't have faith that my body would be able to do anything with it. So I felt like I would have just been wasting his money. So at that point in time, we were both emotionally taxed and exhausted. Mm -hmm. So basically for over two years now, our lives have revolved around getting pregnant and fertility treatments and the ups and the downs of did it work? Did it not work? Did it work? Did it not work? We were exhausted. Um, him emotionally and financially and me physically and emotionally. And, and so we just decided at that point in time to take a break and see, let things kind of simmer and see where we've, you know, how we're feeling. And then from there, we just decided that we were going to leave it in God's hands and uh -huh. not move forward with any more fertility treatment. Oh my gosh. Okay. I, I need to pause for an ad break. And I just, I, before I do that, I just want to thank you for sharing such a, a vulnerable story. When we come back, I do want to ask you, I want to dive in a little bit to the, to the grief because I, I think it's very specific. So we'll be right back. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. 
With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash noise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash noise to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash noise. I have definitely been in that place where my paycheck ran out before the next one got here. Life doesn't happen bi-weekly, so why should payday? The money you earn can be in your hands today with Earnin. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work, up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. Just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck, then access up to $100 a day as you work and leave an optional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. You can use Earnin to pay for a girl's night out, a last minute gift for a loved one, or even summer camp for the kids. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security. It gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E A R. N-I-N in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in noise under podcast when you sign up. It really, really helps the show. Noise under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. <laughs> All right. Before the break, we were, you were, you know, telling your story and, and, you know, you ended with talking about how exhausted both you and Mark were emotionally and I'm sure mentally and for you physically. And like, I also want to underscore that this was all happening during the pandemic. So you mentioned like, not only was he not allowed to come back there with you to support you, but you're having to deal with the stress of what's going on globally, probably how do, how I just am remembering how it was like in doctors' waiting rooms and having to wait longer for appointments and they can only take certain like just all of that just logistics of how hard it was mm-hmm. to be going through that and so can you talk to us about the the grief in general and how how I, I think people who don't who have never experienced this might struggle to you know like we we can understand like the the grief around miscarriage. Or obviously the gr- the grief around like losing a ch- child or having like a stillborn baby, but like talk to us about about this and like what was what was kind of um, was there was there anything that sort of surprised you that took you by surprise about the grief? Um, I don't know if it was if surprising is the way that I would describe it, um, but you know I- I'm not just grieving the loss of the baby that never was. I'm also grieving the identity of the person I thought I was going to be my entire life. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I remember saying like, if I get nothing else out of this life, I, all I want is a little girl, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all that I ever wanted was to be a mom. And I didn't know how to envision a future without that. And that, that still hits me in moments that I don't expect, you know, where I'll be fine just moving about my day, making dinner. And then the thought it will pop in my head, like, oh, I can't wait to teach my kids about this one day. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, oh, wait, right. That's not going to happen. So I guess that's kind of unexpected is how it creeps in in just the most mundane parts of life, you know, you would kind of expect it when you hear a pregnancy announcement from someone or you expect it when it's, you have to go to a baby shower or you see your kid, your friends interacting with their kids or whatnot, but you don't expect it when like, 
you're cooking or gardening or doing something like that. And just this random thought that you don't even know is going to happen pops in your head and you realize like, oh, that's a dream that's never going to get realized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are those moments, I think, are almost harder than the in your face ones. Mm -hmm. And I, I did all the things. Um, I'm very woo woo, you know, Mm -hmm. so I would meditate every morning. And literally, I could see my children. There was two, there was a girl and a boy, and I would see them with me. And I could literally feel their spirits with me. And so it's like, how can I have that experience so vividly? And then have it not come to be, or you see other people that don't seem to value being a parent, um, or they mistreat their children and you can't help but think, why God? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I know we would be amazing parents. You know, Mm -hmm. I know I was, I, my whole life, my whole career has been built around working with children and helping other parents with their children and being really good at it. And the, my own brother has four children that he walked out on, you know, like it's, it's how do I, how do you reconcile living in a world where that can be true and me not being able to be a mother can be true, you know? Sounds like that's the, you know, going to be one of the big areas of work for a lot, a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That reconciling. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a song um, that Taylor Swift in her latest album called Bigger Than the Whole Sky. And yes, have you heard it? I yeah. Love that so song. Okay. if you have ever <laughs> gone through this experience and you haven't heard that song, go listen to it because it literally like speaks directly to the experience. And um, one of the lyrics is, did some bird flap its wings over in Asia or did some force take you because I didn't pray? And it's like, mm-hmm. those are the things you wrestle with and grapple with in your mind. Like, what did I do wrong? Was it, you know, was it because I wasn't relaxed enough when I was going through IVF or was it because I ate popcorn and I know that's an in- inflammatory food one day and you just the beating yourself up of all the things that like maybe you didn't do right. Mm -hmm. What you mentioned about it being during the pandemic, we isolated ourselves quite a bit Mm -hmm. and turned down a lot of social engagements at that time. And, you know, it caused me to feel even further isolated from my social circle because we couldn't risk me getting sick. Which makes things worse because you're not connecting with people who care about you. And and it just, it, the whole thing w- was so difficult. So so speaking of other people, can you tell us, because I know that this, you know, what you were, you were struggling with is, is similar to the level of difficulty and, and grief that people experience when a loved one dies or, you know, egregious, egregious hard things. So what are some of the things that, I mean, I know I can imagine what some of them are, what people say that are unhelpful and, you know, in hopes that people listening to this will, will refrain from saying these types of things. What yeah. Are they? Um, I mean, it's always well-intentioned for the most part. <laughs> I actually sure. had my eye doctor, <laughs> I, it somehow had come up Maybe she had asked me if I had kids and I said, no, we tried. It didn't work out for us. And she was like, well, then it wasn't meant to be. (laughs) Oh my God. So it was almost funny because she was so matter of fact about it. And it didn't, that didn't bother me too much because I was, that was a few months ago. So it was like a little bit farther removed from the situation, but like, don't do that. (laughs) Don't say that, please. (laughs) I would, my Um, big mouth would have been like, well, it's one way to look at it. Weird, but okay. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, yeah, I was just shocked. I couldn't believe she said it. But yeah, I think for me, because of the situation with my tubes, where, and that's the thing where you don't know what anybody's situations are. I had, I was in a support group with another woman who ended up having to go through a hysterectomy because she was misdiagnosed with cancer. 
And that's why, you know, and so you don't know what parts people even have left in their body after going Mm -hmm. through fertility treatment. And so hearing people say, oh, my so-and-so went through that and, and they ended up having the baby and, and all of a sudden they got, they got pregnant without even trying. And that, you know, I know that it's people trying to give hope, but when you're saying it to someone that that most likely is not either definitely can't happen for, or most likely won't happen for, it's not comforting. It's just a reminder of what can't be. Mm -hmm. And so I would caution people, you know, not to share stories of other people that had success in some way or another going through the fertility journey, because it might not be seen as helpful. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Which is, I know, counterintuitive, because you feel like you're saying a positive story of hope, but it's, it can, it's actually not helpful in many circumstances. And what is helpful is just saying, I'm really sorry that happened for you is how can I support you? Or I'm here to, if you ever need to listen, you know, or if it's someone that you're a really close friend with, maybe just asking them straight out, like, especially if you have kids and they, you know, they wanted kids and it didn't work out for them. Like ask them straight out, like, how do you want me to handle yes. kid kid events moving forward? Do you want me to include them? Or is it too painful to even be invited? Or do you want to be invited? But you know, if you decline, I will totally understand and just get, find out directly from them, like how they would like to move forward because it also doesn't feel good to be excluded because you don't have kids either. Right. But they're, cause they're just assuming that, that you, that that's helpful. Right. Yeah. I, I love, I love that so much. And I, I'm sure that, you know, we could spend several minutes talking like the list of unhelpful things that, that people would say, but I think maybe the bottom line of it is don't try to fix it. Like yeah. as well-intentioned as it is. And like you said, like sometimes a story of hope is more unhelpful than anything, than even being neutral and, and, you know, giving, giving advice. I think, especially if you are someone who has never experienced it is incredibly unhelpful. And mm-hmm. the best thing, like always default back to exactly what you said and just acknowledging how difficult the situation must be for the person. Yeah. And the other thing is don't ask the person like, oh, well, have you thought about trying this? Or have you thought about trying that? Like, have you thought about getting a second opinion? Have you thought about adoption? Like those sorts of things. Because for us, we made a choice to stop when we did. And it's a multifaceted choice, which mm-hmm. hopefully you could glean from my story that is very layered <laughs> and has a lot of components to it. And to be asked the things, well, why don't you get a second opinion or why don't you consider adoption? It almost comes with an innuendo of why did you give up? And at least that's how it feels on the yeah. receiving end of it. And because it is something that I struggle with. Like, did I give up too soon? Should I have kept pursuing? Should I have gotten a second opinion? The fact of the matter is like these things and the financial reasons are the biggest reasons that people stop fertility treatments. These things aren't free. We Mm -hmm. have other goals and dreams that we want out of life. And it wasn't technically, and while my husband is so generous and supportive. It wasn't technically my money that was footing the bill here. And I didn't feel comfortable spending other people's money on my body anymore. I had lost faith in its ability to do what supposedly it was made to do. I'm sure that that's, you know, what you just said, the identity of, you know, that my, as a woman, with these particular parts, we grow up with the assumption, like, this is what my body is made to do. Like, this is largely, you know, like, quote unquote, like what I am here for. Yeah. And to grapple with that, I always assumed that that was part of 
the grief and the myriad of emotions. I, 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 I can only assume like I would feel anger, frustration, just raging at the sky for what, what should have been. You do, you feel like, or at least for me, I, your value as a woman feels mm-hmm. diminished. Like I, I am a failure as a woman, but there's also a societal viewpoint that is a woman's value is in motherhood, whether it's overt or not, it's definitely there mm-hmm. in this culture and society. Let, like, let's switch gears a little bit just for sake sake of time. I know this could be like a three hour, a three hour tour <laughs> and is, and is definitely, you know, should be, you know, how have you, you specifically, and also you and Mark as a couple, I don't know if those are separate, if you want to talk about them together or, or which, but how have you moved forward? And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's not like a line of demarcation where you're like, December 31st, 2021, we decided <laughs> to move forward. Like it's an ongoing progress process. Yeah. But can you talk to us about what that looks like? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There actually almost was like a switch flipped. Um, so it was Thanksgiving time where we had our failed second round of IVF and I was pretty low <laughs> for all of, you know, the rest of November and December and everything. And then I decided to throw myself into Christmas that year and like went over the top, like decorating and making cookies and everything else. I know you love a, a good to- theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was just my way of distracting my brain from all the sadness and everything. And then I got COVID, (laughs) Um, which was another distraction from the sadness, which I think was good because it helped me get to the place on the other side of it, which was sometime in like January, I, I kind of had this moment where I was like, you know, because just to like backtrack for a second. Back in 2018, my life was a hot mess. <laughs> it was. It was. You needed I to was, go through that. <laughs> it was a hot, hot mess. I was living in my the frog at my friend's house, which is the family room over the garage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I went through a lot to turn my life around, including using your programs and the Daring Way curriculum, which was a huge game changer. Um, and no, she did not pay me to say this, folks. <laughs> I was like, thanks for the plug. <laughs> yeah, no. And then I, I quit drinking and mm-hmm. I literally changed my life with all of those hard things that I, I choices I made to turn my life around. I called in the love that I always wanted. I quit my full-time job and started a business, which was now thriving. If I looked at my life, aside from the childlessness, if I looked at my life now or at that point in 2022, and it was me back in like that time, 2018, I'd be like, girl, what are you crying about? Look at <laughs> everything you have in your life right now. Like it's everything you wanted. You did it. You turned your life around. And I think because I went through that dark night of the soul back then, mm-hmm. which honestly was deeper and darker than going through this fertility journey. And Interesting. if you can believe it, mm-hmm. I decided like, you know what? I did not work so hard to get to where I am today to live in a state of perpetual grief and sadness over the one thing I can't have. Mm -hmm. So I made a decision to start changing my mindset to looking towards what are the joyful aspects of not having a child? Like what are the benefits of living a child-free existence? And technically child-free is a term used towards people that never wanted to have children or choosing not to have children. Mm -hmm. And childless or childlessness is, is usually geared towards people that are in my circumstance that wanted a child and end up not being able to have one for whatever reason. And I think it's important to say that because when I was first going through this whole situation, like I didn't even know what the term was to look for other people like me. Mm -hmm. And in case you don't know, it's childless, not by choice. (laughs) The acronym is CNBC. Um, And when I discovered that that's what the term was, I started Googling and I found podcasts and I found Instagram accounts and I Mm. found books and I found all of these resources that were now accessible to me. I was 
working with a therapist at the time. She was the one that told me these terms to look up. And she was someone that specialized specifically in infertility. That's right. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And then I joined support groups for other women. Um, I found some Facebook groups. There's one local of like childless women of Philly or something like that so that I could maybe find other women in my area that I could connect with in similar situations. So I kind of applied similar strategies that I did back in 2018 to other areas of my life, but I applied it to being childless. And, you know, I started reading books. I followed Instagram accounts. I joined support groups. And and I also started leaning into the things that I was able to do the freedom that I was able to have because I didn't have kids. So I decided to do a play in New York, (laughs) which if I had kids, I wouldn't have been able to do because I had to commute to do the Mm -hmm. play. It was great because I was having such a great time in that moment and was really able to just enjoy being with my friends. It was like, you know, the world was opening back up again after the pandemic. We were Mm -hmm. able to perform live theater again. And It was like the OG cast of my theater company that was all in this one play. And so it was a great, that was a great experience. And that really helped me get to that place of feeling more joy than grief and sadness. And it's there always. And it hits me at times that I cannot expect, you know, I was Mm -hmm. just out to dinner this past weekend and pregnant woman walked by. And immediately I thought to myself, like, oh, I'm never going to feel that. Yeah. And it, and every time I have those thoughts, like, it's like a dagger right to the core of my soul. With any grief, it doesn't go away, but time does help dull the pain. Mm-hmm. So it feels a little less sharp yeah. when it happens. And it's not something that typically takes me down the way that it once did. Yep. That's the goal. I we're gonna we have to take one more ad break and then when we come back, I want to ask you specifically about the therapist and I want to talk about grief a little bit more. So hang tight. Today's podcast is sponsored by Midi Health. Ladies, are you over 40 like me and dealing with hot flashes, insomnia, brain fog, moodiness, some vaginal dryness, or weight gain? Don't just accept it as part of aging. These symptoms are often linked to hormonal changes during perimenopause and menopause. At Midi Health, they get it. Their experts know what you're going through and how to help. Midi clinicians are menopause specialists offering safe, effective, FDA-approved solutions. And guess what? Midi Care is covered by insurance. So stop pushing through it alone. Schedule a virtual visit and dive deep into your unique symptoms and health background. You'll walk away feeling heard and with a plan to start feeling better. Visit MIDI Health today and reclaim your well-being. You deserve to feel great. Book your virtual visit today at joinmidi.com. That's joinmidi.com. Joinmidi.com. You know when you're listening to a song on the radio and you get the profound feeling that the song playing was written about you? Now imagine having the power to gift that same incredible feeling to someone you love with an original song from Songfinch that actually is written just for them. Songfinch lets you create an original radio quality song inspired by your own life and the people you love. It's completely unique, personal, and lasts forever. Whether your song is for Father's Day, an upcoming graduation, wedding, or anniversary, or even just a gift to show your loved one how much you care, start your song now to lock in one of Songfinch's top artists. I gifted Songfinch to myself, a song about my late father, and I'm so excited to play you a clip. Flipping through the slides of learning how to live and how to love And coming undone a father-daughters without So she writes it down One of my clients heard about Songfinch from this podcast, and so she had a song created for her son who was graduating, and she told me that they both cried when she played it for him and that it exceeded her expectations. For a limited time, Songfinch is letting our listeners upload their song to Spotify for free so you and the lucky person you gift it to can listen to it anywhere, 
anytime. Go to songfinch.com slash noise and start your song. After you purchase, you'll be prompted to add Spotify streaming for your original song for free, a $50 value. Again, my URL is songfinch.com slash noise. Don't forget to share your song with us too. songfinch.com slash noise. I want to I want to point this out and this is not at all to like pat me on the back but I I remember when I remember talking to you when you were in the middle of it and I had suggested that you find a therapist and I rem- I remember specifically telling you like you need to find a therapist who's who has a specialty around this topic because I I am a huge advocate for therapy and I do think that there are some things that we're going through in life where th- you need a specialty and and this was one of them. And so can you tell people how you found her? I think you had suggested to go on like psychology today. Uh-huh. Is that what it is? A psychology today. I think it's dot com. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I recommend that's it all I, the time. That's how I found her. Mm-hmm. Um because you can search for specificities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's how I ended up finding her. Yeah. And you know, she wasn't covered by my insurance. Ugh. God damn yeah. it, United States. <laughs> But I was fortunate enough, again, to have a supportive partner, and he split the cost with me. So at first, I was going weekly, and we split it 50-50. It was like, I think it was 150 a session. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and they were 50-minute sessions. And so, and then over time, I I dialed it back to every other week. And then after that, I think I dialed it down to like once a month. And eventually, I was like, I think, I think. I had gotten everything I could out of that particular dynamic with her. It was immensely helpful at the Mm -hmm. time, you know, and we didn't just talk about the fertility stuff. We talked about all of the, all of the things that goes into what makes me, me and my psychosis. (laughs) Neurosis. Um, Yes, neurosis. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) It sounds a little less dramatic. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not. If I'm anything, it's dramatic. That's true. <laughs> this is true. You do have the flair. But anyway, yeah, I highly, highly recommend working with a trained professional so that you can mm. really, she was able to hold space for me to have my pity parties and then also was able to provide the resources necessary that I needed to move forward. And so I started working with her when I was in the thick of the fertility treatments. So I already had this dynamic in place when it all didn't work out. Mm -hmm. You were talking about what you were going through in 2018 and you, you just like had all these life circumstances that were just hitting you all at once. And your story was the the client that I talked about in Make Some Noise where the chapter on like writing it out, because like sometimes like you can have all the tools, like you can be into it in personal development and therapy. And then just sometimes life hands you a fucking shit sandwich and you have to just like take it day by day. And you did. And I, and I want to just acknowledge that and underscore what you were saying about how that impacted you in a positive way to go through this this next difficult chapter of your life and how you were able to use that as a jumping off point as like cuz I talk all the time about how confidence is gained and like through resilience cuz sometimes like we try things and it doesn't work out and you know for you during that time it was a relationship it was just a, a several different things and 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 like you gleaned from that a a sense of resilience and confidence that like, okay, yeah, this infertility fucking sucks. And I can also make it to the other end and still Mm -hmm. live with, with the grief. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And also what you were saying about grief, I, I I understand that different circumstance. And, you know, when my, when my, when my dad died and the way I describe it, you know, we love a good metaphor over here is Mm -hmm. that grief feels like the way I describe it is it's like somebody rearranged all the furniture in your house and they rearranged it terribly. Like there's a coffee table in the hallway. There's like (laughs) all these, like the toilets, like in the middle of the bathroom. You stub your toe on every time you walk past it. For a while you stub your toe on everything. You trip over all this furniture. You're angry that it doesn't make any sense. And then eventually you just kind of get used to it. Like it's still there. Mm-hmm. It's still there. And every once in a while you stub your toe on it, you know, like mm-hmm. what happened to you in the restaurant and you have to just accept it and you have to like ride out that grief of seeing that pregnant woman and and like having that feeling co- overcome you of like, 
I'm never going to experience that. And like shed the tears, say what you need to say to whoever you're out to dinner with, like do the Mm -hmm. journaling when you get home, but it just gets a little bit easier to navigate. Yeah, it does. And I also think that part of the reason that it was easier to navigate is because I wasn't numbing it. Mm. People tend to, and this was my pattern back in the day, I would numb to get through my tough situations. And because I numbed to get through my tough situations, I never actually like went all the way through them. And so that's what I did in 2018. You know, I had to go all the way through all the stuff that I'd been numbing all that time. But because I was going through this with my eyes wide open and actually feeling the feelings, I feel like it took, I went through it quicker than Mm -hmm. I would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I hear that a lot from people and I've experienced that as well, like going through difficult times. So before we close, is there anything, I know you have a lot of resources. So Mm -hmm. do you want to mention any of those? And I can, you know, if you want to send me a list, I can put them in the show notes for people. And also I just want to make sure that if there's anything that we didn't touch on that you want to say before we go, so you can feel complete about this. So I'm not sure when this episode is airing, but World Childless Week is September 11th through the 17th worldchildlessweek.net. They have a, a bunch of resources that if people go to that website, they can, you know, I think see recordings from past year's events and speakers. And if it's past the date of the live event this year, I think you can see the recordings from this year as well. There is a community called Gateway, I believe. And they have, um, I think it's hosted on Mighty Network. Jody Day is also another big name in the child is not by choice um, world. She she's written books on it. So those are just a few that I can think of off the top of my head. But if you Google childless not by choice, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and you can look and see the things that will resonate with your experience mm-hmm. and um, what you're going through. I guess in terms of leaving remarks is just don't forget that if you have someone in your life that has gone through this, just don't forget that they've gone through it and that, you know, they're still raw about it and they still may need to like, they still still may need your support and they still may need to cry about it, even if it's been a few years since the miscarriage or the failed IVF or whatever the circumstance, just don't assume just because it was like a short-lived event that it isn't impactful for the long term. I want to just, again, highlight that last part that you said, because I have, I know someone who had three miscarriages and she's in, you know, it was at least a decade and a half ago and she still gets sad about it every once in a while. And it's, it's one of those things that I think takes both of us by surprise when it happens, you know, and, and, and it just, just holding that space for your friend and just allowing them to feel whatever it is that they need to feel and, you know, just experience it however. And then as a friend, you just allow it, you know, and just, you, you don't have to try to fix it. You don't have to just mm-hmm. ask how, and if you're confused about what to do, like, just ask how you can support them the best. And just let them know that you don't judge them at all for their choices, their decision. If they were going through fertility treatments and decided to stop, like don't make sure you they know that you don't judge them and, and fully support their choices because that's something that they probably judge about themselves. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's something that the guilt of like, oh, well, did I give up too quickly is definitely something that has popped into my head more than once. Thank you so much for being here and and sharing your story so openly and vulnerably. And I know that this will help people who have either struggled with it or may struggle with it someday, or just will inevitably know someone who has just take, taking a peek of what it's like. And so I appreciate you so much. Listeners, thank you so much for being here with me and my guest today. Your support of the show means the world to me. And remember, it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. 
Hey listeners, if you work for a company that does professional development, did you know that I offer leadership training, more specifically empathy and assertiveness and how it makes stronger teams? You can see more on my speaking page at andreaowen.com slash speaking, where there's also a contact button there. So you can fill out that form and let's chat. I'd like to introduce you to the Minimalist Moms podcast. It's hard enough being a mom, and the last thing you need is stress from too much stuff and an overcrowded schedule. For too long, I lived with the mindset that bigger was better, and the more I added to my life, instead of feeling better, I felt overwhelmed. It was time for a radical new mindset. Less is more. I'm not into extremes. I didn't throw everything away. My brand of minimalism is more about adding than subtracting. Get rid of the excess to make room for what you love. In other words, it's about living life with purpose. I hope you'll listen in and my guest and myself can inspire you to think more and do with less. The Minimalist Moms Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts.